Hey friends, it's Jessica and Hannah here from Three Rivers Homestead and we're back with another weekly video for the Three Rivers Challenge. This is the pantry challenge that I do every January and February. And so I have more meals to share with you. These are different meals than I have shared in the previous week's videos. As you guys know, I'm not sharing every meal of the whole week because some of them are repeats from um, things that I've shared in previous week's videos. So I'm just showing you kind of the new stuff and there's lots of fun uh, recipes that we were able to create from our pantry stock this week and that will be shared in this video. I'm also toward the end of this video gonna show you how we attempted or are attempting experimenting I guess with making mead from the fermented honey that we found on the pantry shelves when we did a clean out last week. And then we are also going to share with you winter sowing, which is something that we started this week. We started some seeds, and I'm going to show you our method for doing that toward the end of the video. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started on what is this week six, I believe, of the Three Rivers Challenge for 2023. Okay, we'll start the meals with this is just, I guess, a snack or a little treat that you could make for your family whenever you have leftover pie crust, pie dough. We made a chicken pot pie later on in this week, and so on this particular morning, I had some leftover crust that I decided to roll out and use a biscuit cutter to make into little circles. We took an apple from um, cold storage and sliced it up. You put one little apple slice per circle, sprinkle a little cinnamon and sugar on top, fold it in half, and then we're going to bake these in the oven on 350 for about 25 to 30 minutes. And what we end up with is something that my children have dubbed as apple smileys. And you'll see why here in a minute. But these are just a nice treat. Um, you could make them as a snack for the kids in the middle of the day. Or like I said, these were just an addition to our breakfast on this particular morning. So as you can see, as that dough kind of puffs up, you get what looks like a little smile. And that's why the kids call them smileys. They're really cute and really delicious. The kids really enjoy this, so it takes about 10 minutes to make these, and you will delight your children with them. <laughs> so here's how we served them on this morning. Um, we just have a plate of those. Each child was able to have like three of them. We had some leftover rolls. We're having sun butter, and this is what we use in place of peanut butter in our house because my son's allergic to peanuts. And then we have a selection of jams and jellies, some pear butter, grape jelly, blueberry jam, and this is what the kids wanted on this morning. Now let's move on to a lunch. A lot of people view baked beans as a side dish. Sometimes we eat them as a full lunch. So I had my beans soaking overnight. These are pinto beans and black turtle beans. I had them soaking in water with a little bit of apple cider vinegar. That The acid in the vinegar helps make these more digestible after they soak overnight. So we're just going to drain the water from these beans and then we're going to cook them with these are the drippings left over from some barbecued beef ribs that I recently made. So there's little bits of beef ribs in there. We have the fat, all of that barbecue flavor. So delicious. I always use this for baked beans. We also have a beef roast um, drippings. These were left over from a simple beef roast. We're going to add one pint here of French onion soup base. This is just concentrated onion flavor in some beef broth. And then I also have a pint of home canned barbecue sauce from 2021 that needs to be used up. And so we're going to add all of this to our pot with the beans. I decided there wasn't enough liquid in there. You can see it needs to be covered a little more. And so I'm going to add another pint of beef broth, also adding a little cube of garlic puree. And this can sit on the stove while we do school and simmer and cook those dried beans. The baked beans are going to be the main course, I guess the protein source for the meal. So we need to work on a side dish. I decided to make some quick biscuits. This is my biscuit recipe here. And I do a couple substitutions. Um, in place of butter, I typically use lard. You can see right there it calls for a half a cup of butter and then in place of milk I will use water or um, any kind of nut milk like cashew milk that I might have in the house so I've got all my dried ingredients here and then we add the wet and I had two little helpers that wanted to <laughs> mix in I guess cut in the other ingredients and they're very happy to help you can see little Benji here is upset he wants his turn so of course we had to 
give him a turn as soon as John um, got bored with the task. I sort of make my biscuits differently every time. Sometimes I do drop biscuits. Sometimes I'll cut them into, you know, perfect little circles. Today I'm just rolling it out and using a pizza cutter to make like little rectangular shapes. And it is actually very hard to cut um, this while holding a camera. So I'm going to need to put it down to finish up. But there we go. Those are the shapes that we made. I just kind of folded the little rectangles over in half and it got the job done. So there are our baked beans. They are delicious. So I always, if we're having barbecued um, beef ribs kind of in the crock pot, I will always on my menu plan make baked beans later on in the week so that I can repurpose those drippings because they are just perfect for baked beans. The kids will take their biscuit here and they'll just dip it into the baked beans and that is how they like to eat them. Just a really simple meal. Lots of um, good protein for the kids here. And everybody was happy. Let's move on to another really simple meal. We are going to make chicken pot pie. I have um, have my chicken pot pie filling that is canned here. I've done a video on canning this before. You can see it has our homegrown chicken, veggies, onion, all of the flavorings. To this, I'm going to add an extra quart of homegrown chicken in the broth. Together, that should be enough. We are going to add freeze-dried celery and freeze-dried corn, and that will just rehydrate in that extra broth. And we're using arrowroot powder to thicken it up into a gravy. Once we got it all in a pot, we're adding some parsley, some salt and pepper. Just get this all spiced up and tasty and ready to go into our pan. So that pie crust that I mentioned that I had leftovers from, this was the meal that I was using the pie crust for. We could see my pie crust calls for cold milk and I just use water since we can't have dairy. And there we go. We lined the bottom of our baking dish with the pie crust. Then we're just gonna pour in our filling. And then we're gonna be using the same biscuit recipe that I just showed you as a topping for our pot pie. Sometimes I like to do a pie crust topping and sometimes I prefer to do a biscuit topping. And I'm just gonna show you how I roll that out and just kind of flip it upside down, peel away the parchment paper, and it's just a really easy way to top that pot pie and saves on mess using the parchment paper there. Baked it in the oven for about 45 minutes on 350 and this is how it turned out. So then we cut it into our little pieces. And as always, you guys know, I kind of portion it out for the children. And then any big kids that are still hungry, they'll go back and they'll get seconds or thirds as needed. And we very rarely have leftovers because the big kids will just eat until there is nothing left. So just an easy chicken pot pie recipe. Um, and you guys can find the video on the filling in the description of this video. All right, let's move on to another meal here. So we are gonna make kind of like a zucchini bread, but it's gonna be GAP style. You guys know I did the GAPS diet for a long time to help heal myself of my Crohn's. So we are gonna take um, freeze dried zucchini slices. You can see those are just very easily powdered up. We have a bunch of these to use. So today is the perfect day to do it. And we are going to end up rehydrating those zucchini slices with a little bit of home canned apple juice here. That's the great thing about freeze dried food is that you don't have to rehydrate it with water to boost the nutrition. You can rehydrate sweet things with juice or with milk. If you want something more savory, you can rehydrate your veggies with um, things like broth and it'll just add extra nutrition where there would have just been water. So we got that all mixed up. We are gonna add some eggs to the zucchini and apple juice mixture. Next, we are going to add some honey. This is gonna be our sweetener. I'm adding, oh, I don't know, approximately a half a cup of honey maybe, and mixing that all in there. We're gonna add about a cup of sunflower seed butter. You could use peanut butter or cashew butter, any kind of um, nut butter that you prefer. Next thing, we are gonna add um, cacao powder. These are gonna be kind of like a chocolatey zucchini bread. We added vanilla and some cinnamon. And once we've got that all mixed together, 
This is going to be our grain-free chocolate zucchini pie or bread or whatever we're going to call this. I'm going to split this recipe up between two different pie dishes and I just need to get them greased up. We use lard to grease our dishes, just kind of rub it there on the bottom. Pour in our batter and then we baked this on 400 for approximately, um, I think it was 25 to 30 minutes, just until the center of that is done. Now it's much better to wait until it cools to cut it, but I had children that were very hungry on this morning, so I went ahead and cut it while it was still warm. I'll show you the difference in texture once it cools down here in a minute. But the children each got a couple slices of this. And then on this particular day, we had some leftover steak from dinner the night before. So as some added protein, they had some steak with their breakfast. So I can't eat gluten and many grains. So this is always a treat for me to be able to eat the breakfast I make. That's what that looks like there. It's, see, it's solid, almost like a brownie texture. But remember, it's flourless and full of that zucchini. All right, time to make another meal. Speaking of grain-free meals, we are gonna make potato pizzas. These are what my potatoes and storage are looking like. Some are getting a little soft, but they're holding up pretty well. Um, but we need to use these. And we're also kind of getting low on flour, so it's a great way to make a pizza without using up our flour, and it'll be something that I can eat. So let me show you how I make pizzas using potatoes as the crust. The first thing we're gonna to need to do is turn them into hash browns. I have this handy tool here. It's, um, I guess, a spiralizer for vegetables, and I'll link it in the description. And this is what we're gonna to use to turn these potatoes into a hash brown. Whenever I get this gadget out, um, if children see it, they automatically wanna help, which is a blessing for me. So I've got the children busy spiralizing those potatoes, and I can just play with little Miss Hannah here while they're busy, and oh, once we have them all spiralized, they get out the kitchen scissors and they chop those spirals into smaller pieces to make them, um, I guess, into more of like a hash brown size. Once we get them all chopped up, we're going to drizzle some olive oil over the top and we're going to sprinkle salt and pepper and some garlic salt, um, a little bit of onion powder. We'll get that all sprinkled up in there and stirred around. We're gonna bake it in the oven on 400 until the top of it starts to get a little bit crispy. And then we'll stir it around, bake it just a little bit longer. And then this is going to be the base for our pizza. In the meantime, we need to make a pizza sauce. I pulled a little half pint here of tomato paste. We made this last fall and it's in the freezer. So it needed to be thawed the, the night before and it's all ready to go. I also had this packet in the back of the pantry. It was from a pizza kit and we didn't like this sauce. So it was just sitting back there. So I figure if I mix a little bit of this with our homemade pizza sauce, that maybe that's a way that I can use this up and not have it go to waste. So in my pizza sauce, I do tomato paste, olive oil, oregano, garlic, um, salt, and pepper. So these, I'm doing my first stirring here. The top of them, we're starting to brown a little bit. So we're stirring it around. We're gonna put it back in the oven until these get a little more crispy. Then once they're done, we're just gonna spread the um, tomato pizza sauce on top of the hash browns. And then you're just gonna top it with whatever you would like. We browned up some um, pork sausage and so we're just putting some of that on top. And then all my kids like different toppings. So I have to kind of put some on half and leave some of it plain. We did some green olives. I always pickle various vegetables every year for the children for pizza toppings. I had some pickled jalapenos there. We actually, some of my kids like pickles on their pizza. So I'm putting some of that. And then this is going to go back in the oven to bake for a little while. You saw I sprinkled the top with nutritional yeast. That gives it a little bit of a cheese flavor. And this is what that looks like. We also, I had thrown together a little um, peach pie for the children just so they could have something sweet with their lunch. And then this cuts just like pizza because it's cooked through on the bottom. You can just cut it into little slices, serve it just like you would 
pizza. Now, obviously, if your family can have dairy, sprinkling cheese on top of this would just make it much better. But unfortunately, we can't have dairy, so that isn't an option for us. Um, but maybe in your house, you would like that. So this is just a wonderful gluten-free, grain-free option. You still get the pizza flavor with the hash browns on the bottom. And at this point in the pantry challenge, I need to um, not use up all of my flour. And I am needing to use potatoes. So this was the perfect way to achieve both of that goals for a meal. All right, let's move on to another meal. So these are my 30 minute rolls. This is um, a really easy recipe. It doesn't take a lot of time. It does make a lot of rolls, as you can see, 45, but my family will eat all of those. If you have a smaller family, I would definitely have everything in this recipe, but it's very easy. You first just need to get that yeast activated. That takes most of the time here. And then once it's activated, you're gonna add in your eggs and your flour and all of the other ingredients. I'm using a Bosch mixer, and I do have to recommend, if you have a large family, get yourself a Bosch because you can do large batches of bread in this as compared to like a KitchenAid mixer. This is great for bread baking for a large family. It can um, handle a lot of dough at once, um, whereas I wore out KitchenAid mixer uh, motors <laughs> trying to do too much um, dough in them. So this is what it looks like after it's all mixed. Sometimes I prefer to hand knead just so I can get it to the right texture by feeling it, you know, with my hands. And that's what I did on this particular day. And then all I do is I pinch out a little, um, I guess it's a little larger than a golf ball shaped dough ball. And I kind of form it into a ball and put it on my baking sheet until we have, um, I think we got 44 rolls. So it, almost the 45 that the recipe calls for, but this is what they look like. And then you're going to leave them out and let them just do a quick rise. You know, you're not going to let them rise for a full hour or whatever you would do for other recipes. And you can see they just rise a little bit and then they're ready to go into the oven. And while they're in the oven baking, we're going to move on to making a meatloaf. So for my meatloaf, I have three pounds of beef here. We're going to add a couple eggs. These are water glassed eggs. We're still using those up. We have some salt. We have some Italian seasoning. We're going to do some Worcestershire, I can't pronounce it, Worcestershire sauce. <laughs> and then this is home canned salsa that I drained all of the excess liquid out of. We just want the tomatoes and the veggies and that salsa flavor added to the meatloaf. And that is what I'm putting in. I kind of do it differently every time I make a meatloaf. This is just what I decided to put in it on this particular day. Adam does not like carbohydrates added to his meatloaf. He doesn't like breadcrumbs or rice or anything like that. And so we just strictly do the meat and the eggs and the veggies um, to make him happy. Now that can present a problem because meatloaf does sometimes let off a lot of grease. Oh, I've got a grumpy guy here just woke up from his nap. Okay, so meatloaf, as I was saying, can let off a bunch of grease as it's cooking. And so sometimes the bread crumbs can help like absorb that. So what I do is I put pieces of bread around the outside of the meatloaf and that helps absorb some of that grease. And then after it's all done cooking, I'll take those pieces of bread and feed them to the chickens. They absolutely love it. So um, we both win <laughs> in that case. And our bread is all done, our bread rolls. Gracie here has a little bit of lard that she's melted down. She's decided she's going to paint the tops of the rolls with the lard just to give them a little bit of a shine and some added fat. Lard is actually a very healthy food for you. So we like to get it in our diet as much as possible. It gives us our needed vitamin D during the winter. Lard is one of the highest dietary sources of vitamin D. And it's really important that you eat it during the winter months here in Ohio when we don't have sunshine to get our vitamin D from. This is our really ugly meatloaf after it's done. You can see the bread did its job of absorbing most of that grease. And we're going to clear the bread away. And this is what we are left behind with. We're also going to have some canned corn and our rolls. I, we do different jelly every time, um, but... For this particular meal, I'm using up some hot pepper jelly, 
and it kind of has a little spice to it. And so the kids are having that on their roll. The kids that like ketchup will top it with ketchup, but I don't put a covering on top of my meatloaf of like a ketchup sauce because several of my children do not enjoy that. And so with a large family, you have to please everyone. <laughs> and so sometimes you have to omit certain things. All right, let's make salmon patties. And I do not have canned salmon, so we are going to use our wild for salmon fillets here. If you would like 15% off some salmon, you can get that using the code Three Rivers Homestead. There'll be a link in the description for you. This is great salmon. Here is my salmon patty recipe that I'm using. So one of those fillets will cover two cans of salmon here. And I'm going to double this recipe today. So it would essentially be like I'm using four cans of salmon for this meal. And in place of coconut flour, I'm going to be using almond flour because this is what we have and we need to use it up. All right, so to blend it, I'm just simply put the thawed filet into the blender and I'm pulsing it until it kind of works itself down. And then we can add the other ingredients to the blender. And once again, it's a hard task to do one-handed while holding a camera. All right, this is what that looks like all blended up. We're going to add our eggs. Thankful once again for our water glassed eggs. There we go. We had six of them in storage. We couldn't make meals like this right now if it weren't for the water glassed eggs. And as you can see, they're perfect coming out of the shell. So I have a video on water glassing. I'll link in the description if you want to learn more about that. So as I mentioned, we just blended all of the ingredients for those patties together. And then I'm just literally using my hands and pulling it out of the blender to kind of form it into a patty shape using the biscuit cutter as a guide so that they kind of end up in uniform shapes. These were baked in the oven. And then while they're baking, I am going to make some rice. I'm using the drippings from a pork roast with that peach salsa. You guys know I like to make my pork roast with home canned peach salsa. It's perfect. And then the drippings that are left over are the perfect addition to rice. They give a sweet flavor from the peaches. And there's also some jalapeno in there, so it has a little bit of spice. I just literally dump that into um, the rice as it's cooking, and it's delicious. So this is what our salmon patties looked like coming out of the oven. Ugly food, but nutritious food. There's so much nutrition in this meal for my children that um, doesn't really matter what it looks like. I know that bothers some of you. <laughs> Ugly food to us, we just care about having the best ingredients possible, and that's what I feel like this this meal represents. This was actually a small meal because we ate this on a, um, a night before my children had ballet and karate. So they eat a tiny meal before their activities. And then when they come home later on, they don't get home until almost nine o'clock and then they will have snacks before bed. So a lot of them don't like to eat a big meal before their activities. So there's leftovers for those of them that want more than one patty. And a couple of the big kids will do that, but the little ones will just eat one patty before their activities. They like to top meals like this. Some of them like mustard, some of them like ketchup, and some of them just enjoy the flavor of it plain. Okay, so last week we had honey that we found on the pantry shelves that had fermented. And now I'm going to show you the process for turning that into mead. So... This is what that looked like last week. You guys will remember the honey, it kind of had crystallized on the bottom of the jar. And then the top of the jar, we had this liquid honey that smelled like alcohol. You could obviously tell it was fermented. And so in last week's video, I showed you how we were able to pour the top of that off. And I tasted the crystallized honey on the bottom and it tasted perfect. So we were able to salvage the gallon and a half of honey that was in the bottom of these jars but the stuff on the top of the jars, I don't like the taste of it for um, my tea or other uses. So I needed to find something else that I could do with it. Let me show you what we were left with. We had two jars of this fermented um, honey. And it actually works out that it takes one quart of fermented honey or one quart of honey to make a gallon of mead. So that's what we're going to do. All of this honey here is salvaged. I've been using it for baking. This is what I used in that zucchini um, meal that I made earlier in this video. So this honey tastes perfect and has been working out wonderfully for us. Now let me show you what you need to make mead. 
Here are our supplies that we gathered and I got these off of Amazon, so I will link them all in the description. Of course, you need your honey, and as I mentioned, it'll take one quart of honey per gallon of mead that you're going to make. I got these glass um, gallon jars off of Amazon, as well as these airlocks. These are what are going to go on the top of the, the gallon jar and help control the release of the gases from the fermentation process. We are gonna flavor our mead. I'm gonna use blueberries in one batch. These are just canned blueberries in the juice. And we are gonna use Concord grape juice in the other batch. And this is gonna hopefully turn out delicious. I'm just trying to salvage something that otherwise might just be kitchen waste and turn it into something that we actually might use. And it's just um, a great way to repurpose this honey. My friend, Vin Venison for Dinner, I'm going to link her YouTube channel in the description of this video, and her and her husband, um, oh my goodness, you guys, can you tell that I don't sleep very much? She and her <laughs> husband, <laughs> um, they are great at making me. They have lots of tutorials on their Instagram page and YouTube, so I kind of gleaned everything that I needed to make this mead from her resources, so definitely check her out. But I was using a slightly different um, process here because I, my honey was already fermented. So I basically skipped the first step of the fermentation process and I'm moving on to kind of a second ferment with fruit. Um, I'm finding this is very similar to when I used to make kombucha. You know, you do an initial ferment to get the tea fermented and then you do a second ferment to actually flavor it. And that's kind of what we're doing. This is a second fermentation with the fruit flavor. And this is purely experimental. We're gonna see how it turns out. I'm hoping it will be delicious and I will definitely take you guys along um, and let you know how, how it all turns out. So my first batch of mead, I'm making sure to label the top because they look identical. <laughs> I'll let you know how that goes. We are nearly out of baking powder, which is very unfortunate. We do a lot of baking. And it's one of those things I had a baby right before the challenge. And normally I would have um, purchased a little extra so that this didn't happen, but it happened. And so later on in this video, I'll show you what we're going to do to kind of make our own baking powder. But for now, I had enough to do this recipe. We are repurposing the blueberries. I used the juice in our mead, but now I had all of these blueberries left over. So I just decided to toss them into a batch of waffles and in place of the liquid in my waffle recipe, we are just gonna use the wet blueberries and it'll make a much more dense waffle, but it will taste delicious. Little Miss Hannah, she turned two months old this week. Can you guys believe it? She is just getting so big and growing way too fast for us. And I just really need time to slow down, you guys. I just feel like the older I get, the more busy I am. <laughs> I need time to slow down. She's so cute, she's such a joy. So anyways, this is how our blueberry waffles, I've done waffles for you guys before, you know uh, my recipe for that in previous videos, but this is just a day in which we use leftover blueberries. You can repurpose anything. I'm always looking for opportunities to find jars that I have open in my fridge and toss them into the next meal I'm making. So the little kids eat, are eating their waffles first while the big kids are outside doing their morning chores. My big kids handle all of the animal chores for me in the morning while I'm taking care of the little ones and getting breakfast made. And then we kind of eat in shifts like that. So once the little kids are done eating, the big kids are usually in from chores and then they can eat their food. So on some days it works out that way. On some days, if breakfast is taking a little longer to bake, everybody might be in together eating at the same time. Just sort of depends. So let me show you what I'm going to do about this baking powder situation. You can make your own baking powder out of three ingredients. Here we have cream of tartar, and you're gonna use two parts of cream of tartar to one part each of the next two ingredients. So I have baking soda here. So we're gonna do one part of baking soda, and then you need some kind of starch. I'm using tapioca starch because I have it to use up. You could use arrowroot powder, you could use corn starch, any of that. And you don't need the cornstarch if you're just making it as, as is, but if you are going to make a big batch and have it sitting on the shelf, the cornstarch will prevent the caking of the ingredients. So that is what we did, and that should get us by through the rest of the month. We had enough cream of tartar on the shelf, and I don't really use it for anything else, 
And so now we were able to repurpose that into baking powder and it's going to work great. All right, now we're on to our next project. We are gonna do some winter sewing. We are preparing for this year's garden and I have done a video all about winter sewing before. I'm gonna link that video in the description so you can learn all about the science of how this works and, and the entire process in depth. I had one video dedicated to this. And this is our, I guess, way to get around not having a greenhouse. I organized all of my seeds last weekend. I've got them all in order and there are a few things that I still need to order. And I now on this day, I'm deciding what I would like to plant in my winter sown jugs. I typically have the best results with kind of um, greens, herbs, more cold hardy items. So this was my selection here. Why don't I show you what I'm going to be planting? So lots of lettuce. This is my absolute favorite lettuce variety. It's Marvel of Four Seasons. It works great. It doesn't bolt in the summer heat like some of the other lettuce varieties that we can grow. And it's just wonderful. And then I had two other lettuce varieties in my seed um, container that I decided that we would also be planting on this particular day. We are also going to be doing kale. Dinosaur kale is my favorite kind, so we're just going to get one jug of that going. We're also going to do some sage and Swiss chard. Swiss chard always does wonderfully for me in the winter sown jugs. We are going to try rosemary. I have terrible results starting rosemary from seed. I'm trying it in the winter sown jugs this time for the first time because I've heard that they do well if they have a good freeze. So we will see what happens. I also just going to grow two kinds of basil here. We're going to direct sow more basil, but we had lemon basil and sweet basil. We'll start those in the jugs. We're going to do a little borage. I, I plant borage as a companion plant. It's great um, for that purpose. We also eat the flowers in our salads. We're going to do some parsley. You can never have enough parsley. And then this is some dill. We're just going to try that in the winter sown jug, see if we can get a head start on growing our dill. All right, let's get all of these seeds in the Projects like this can be very messy with little ones helping you, so you just have to be organized. I have everything I need. I have my duct tape sitting out. We have a Sharpie marker to label everything. I have my seeds sitting over here. And then, of course, we laid down a blanket um, or a sheet to contain the mess. <laughs> because little ones are going to spill dirt. We have our container of potting soil over here and all of our jugs. And so I just put a call out. This is what I often do with projects like this. There are seven children that are able to help right now. And I just sort of ask who wants to help. And on this particular day, Elizabeth wanted to help along with John. And it's kind of neat because every time we do a project, we'll have a different combination of children that wants to come down and it sort of teaches them to work together, you know, in these different groups every time. So that's a lot of fun. And Elizabeth always seems to take an interest in gardening projects. She's the first one to always volunteer. And I think little John here, he's four. He'll be five here soon. I think little ones just really enjoy putting their hands in dirt. And he wanted to <laughs> sprinkle some seeds in there. And so he was a big help in that regard. All we do after we sprinkle our seeds in is we cover up where we made the cut in our jug with some duct tape and that will kind of hold it together. And as I mentioned, this is our version of a greenhouse. We do not currently have a greenhouse. It's something we've been wanting for a really long time, but it seems like every year other projects financially sort of take precedence. So I just haven't gotten my greenhouse built yet. So we make do in the meantime. And this is what homesteading's about. You just use what you have. And we freeze probably about 15 gallons of apple cider every fall to enjoy through the rest of the winter. And we have these jugs available. So instead of just um, putting them straight into the recycling, why not repurpose them first? And then when we're done planting in them, we'll wash them out and then put them in the recycling. It works great. This is probably the sixth year, I think, that I've, I've planted seeds in these jugs. And I always have good results. So if you want to learn more, like I said, check out my winter sowing video. But this is a great option for you if you live up north, you want to get some seeds started early, and you don't have a greenhouse. And that is it for the projects in this video. I'm going to go ahead and kind of talk to you about where we're at in the Three Rivers Challenge.
All right, guys, and that's it for this week's video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that peek into what we were able to make from the pantry this week and some of the other fun projects that I was able to do with the children here on the homestead. Um, we're reaching that point where we're starting to run out of some things, but I have enough in stock, like, like with the baking powder. We had enough of alternatives to make do for the rest of the challenge. And that's what I'm finding is that by this point, this is my sixth or maybe seventh year that I have done this challenge personally for myself, that I have figured out the things that we tend to run out of if we don't go to the store for a while. And I figured that out in previous years of doing the challenge and have made up for that and now keep more of it in the house so that we don't run out. And so it really isn't much of a challenge for us. Um, when we hit middle of February, the challenge for us is boredom because we kind of get sick of eating the same things. And it would be nice to go to the grocery store and maybe get a few fun items that we don't keep stored here in the house. So my big challenge for the children is kind of coming up with unique uh, meal ideas using what we keep in bulk quantities in the house and so I'm gonna sit down this week and really brainstorm and try to come up with some fun things for the kids and I'll share that for you next week but that's one of the goals of doing this challenge it's not just about saving money and rotating through stock and you know figuring out what you need to grow more of next year or this year in the garden so that you'll be better prepared next year but some of it is just figuring out where the holes are in your storage so that in the future you'll be better prepared for things like this. Because while this is an intentional pantry challenge, there may be times in my life where it isn't intentional and we could be forced to have to eat from what we have stored in the house. You know, financial um, things that happen or um, job loss or you never know what could force you to have to just rely on what you have stored and doing these challenges um, voluntarily at times just makes us better prepared in the future um, so that it wouldn't be a struggle if it were um, something we were forced to do so we we are very blessed and I recognize that blessing that this is something that we can do voluntarily because we are living in a time where food costs are rising and people are really struggling to pay their food bills and so um, it's a blessing you know that we have this food in storage all right all of that just makes it more important to um, grow even more food this year to put more away and not just for our own family but so that we can be a blessing to the people around us if they need um, help and that's part of, of being prepared. That's part of homesteading is being uh, prepared so that you can be a blessing to your community. So speaking of which, I hope that this video um, was a blessing to you and that you were able to take something from it. All right, Miss Hannah and I now are going to go and move on to the next activity that we need to get done here at our house. I hope you guys had a great week and we will see you next week, friends. Bye.